The book we'll be talking about today is a classic work of Gothic horror. Published in 1897, it was a critical and commercial success, spawning multiple stage adaptations as well as a popular silent film. You know the book. What else could it be other than Richard Marsh's The Beetle? Wait, that's not what you thought it was? Welcome to Echoed Words Reviews, and welcome to the second week of the Spooky Spooktober Stories series. This month we'll be exclusively reading horror books. Uh, last week we did The Picture of Dorian Gray, and this week we'll be diving in to this occult uh, Victorian Gothic horror big boy. So as always, hope you're having a great day. Or if you were listening to this uh, before bed, I hope that this lulls you into a restful slumber. Uh, so without further ado, let's dive into Richard Marsh's The Beetle. No booze for this review either, because I am unfortunately still on meds. Uh, what has been a week for you has been like 12 hours for me. So sticking with the oolong tea today. This stuff's great. Everything they do, the oolong, the green, if you can get shochu, it's different than soju. Shochu is like, it's like Japanese vodka. It's made out of like sweet potato. We have a hard time getting it in Oregon because it's a distilled liquor. But if you get it, get either the oolong or the green, mix them together, put ice on them, and it is the Shinjuku cocktail. Uh, it's the cocktail that you get if you go to any of the Golden Guy bars in Tokyo. Really, really, really good. All right, so, the beetle. A book that I hadn't heard of uh, until pretty recently, actually. I was, when I was planning this series, I was looking at, like, you know, must-read gothic horror books, and this one came up. Published in 1897, it's written by a guy named Richard Marsh. Very little is known about him, other than I guess he's a member of the tribe, represent, uh, and that he had been jailed for, like, three weeks for writing fraudulent counterfeit checks or something, so, Yeah. Published the same year as uh, a little sort of obscure horror book that you may know called Dracula. This actually outsold that book by uh, six to one. It was wildly popular in its day. Like I said in the introduction, it spawned uh, stage adaptations, a silent film. Uh, Dracula became popular later on, I guess due to some sort of very highly publicized lawsuit over one of the adaptations. And with themes that would resonate with a modern audience, such as, you know, gender performativity, challenging gender norms, wealth inequality, urban homelessness, radical politics, etc. Why isn't this book more popular? Well, maybe we'll get to the bottom of it. So the book is about this malevolent, shape-shifting entity only ever referred to as the Arab, as it attempts to take its revenge on a member of parliament, Paul Lessingham, for a crime that he committed in his youth in Egypt. A crime that is not revealed to us until towards the end of the book. Note that I will try to keep spoilers to a minimum, however, there will be spoilers. The story unfolds in four sections that are each uh, an individual book told from a different person's point of view. The first is told from the point of view of a homeless man named Robert Holt. Down on his luck and turned away from government housing, he sneaks into what he thinks is an abandoned house. However, the house proves to be far from abandoned as this horrifying entity has taken up residence there. Using the power of mesmerism, it turns him into a slave, stripping his autonomy and his agency from him, as well as really kind of sexually assaulting him. One thing that's kind of interesting in this book is that there's this total preoccupation in trying to ascertain the gender of this entity. It has a masculine face, but a feminine body. And so it not fitting into, I guess, like traditional, you know, gender expectations is the most unsettling thing for people when they fall under its spell and it molests them. Under the control of this being, Robert Holt is tasked with going and robbing the residence of Paul Lessingham. Upon that book concluding, it then switches to the point of view of a man named Sidney Atherton, an inventor, a Victorian dandy, highly opinionated, very unlikable. As we discover very early on, the object of Atherton's affections, his childhood friend Marjorie Linden, is in fact secretly engaged to Paul Lessingham. What follows is a tense chapter as Atherton pushes the boundaries of what's acceptable as he succumbs to this absolute hatred of Paul Lessingham, which then puts him on a collision course with the Beetle. Atherton is currently hard at work making a, a sort of chemical warfare agent, like a poison gas, and uses it in pretty unsavory ways. We then switch to the third book, which I think is the best book of all four of them, and that's from the point of view of Marjorie Linden. 
Marjorie is a really interesting character. Totally bucks the trends of your typical, like, Victorian uh, female character. She's capable, level-headed, independent. She's sort of the archetype of what they called the new woman in Victorian times. In my opinion, her chapter is the high point of the book. It also has, in my opinion, the only scary passage, at least for me. There's a scene that just made the hairs on the, the back of my neck stand up. is pretty unsettling. I think because it played with some of my phobias. And then the fourth chapter is told from the point of view of an investigator, like a detective, named Augustus Champnell. His chapter is a high-energy, frantic race to the finish line, which is ultimately an unsatisfying conclusion. So that's the story in broad strokes. Um, what did I think of the book, though? Not the biggest fan. I think it's really interesting to read more in, like, a historical context. Some of the commentary, which I'll talk about, uh, is pretty interesting. Like, there are some cool ideas there. But overall, I was left wanting. As a work of horror, this didn't really scare me. The book starts pretty strong, actually. Robert Holt's chapter, or section, is pretty good. It, and it is very unsettling when he feels himself, you know, a prisoner in his own body and unable to resist. It actually does get a little unsettling. And then there's a scene in Marjorie's chapter that I, that I talked about that is... At least it plays off of my phobias. I am not big into bugs. I fucking hate roaches so goddamn much. To me, they are absolutely disgusting. And it's funny because Marjorie Linden is the same way. She talks about phobias and is like, I can deal with, you know, snakes and spiders and blah, 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 but I hate beetles. And she uh, is in this room and feels a presence um, in there with her. And so she tries to take refuge under her covers. And that proves to be the wrong move. That scene was, for me, scary. However, overall, the text is not scary. I would hazard a guess that it was much scarier at the time. However, in that, I will say that something like Dracula, at least the last time I read it, which was like 16 years ago, Dracula still has very viscerally unsettling parts to it. Uh, I remember the first time I read Dracula, was, I was 11. So this is like 20 years ago. And I couldn't sleep for like two days. There was a part in it, and I can't exactly remember which part it was, that scared the fucking shit out of me. Like, it, it terrified me. And compounding that was I was also playing Halo at the time, and uh, I was at the part with the flood, and so that scared me. And so then I stopped playing Halo, you know, I took a break from Halo to go read Dracula. And then I really couldn't sleep. I mean, goddamn. <laughs> and I don't think that this has that same sort of, you know, terrifying magic that Dracula has. Now, I know it's probably a bit unfair to compare the two. They are two very different novels. Uh, where the Beatle does succeed, however, is in delivering commentary of the times. And it's funny because, you know, the more things change, the more things stay the same. And I think that a lot of the themes at play here, a lot of the critique of Victorian colonial England, actually dovetail nicely in some of the modern, I guess, like, critical theory. From, you know, post-colonial blowback to rising real estate costs in London and speculative markets. It's playing with a lot of interesting clay. I just don't think that it meshes it all that well. And I could be biased. I'm not the biggest fan of Victorian writing. I find that it just dawdles on and on and on. One of the things that I, I hate in books from this time, and this one has it in spades, is when a character knows something or has a theory and will say that they have a theory or will disagree with somebody who posits their own theory, and then when asked or interrogated, says, no, I will tell you when the time is right. And it's like, God damn it, just tell me. <laughs> it's, I mean, maybe I'm just Im impatient, but that to me, it, it sends me up the wall. And that happens left and right in the fourth chapter when they bring this detective in. The detective seems to have pieced everything together with the minute sort of evidence that he's been given, but will not articulate it until the end. And I get that it's to try and build intrigue and, and build towards a conclusion, but man, that just, it drives me, that just drives me crazy. But you know, I don't want to just rag on this book, especially for things that might be unfair criticisms and, and rooted in my own sort of personal bias when it comes to what I like to read. So what about some of the good stuff? Well, like I said, thematically, there's a lot of really rich territory here. The book is pretty measured in an interesting but also frustrating way in handling its themes. For instance, um, you could read this book and come away with it with a, a critique on colonialism. How this meddling 
in countries halfway across the world is dangerous and breeds this sort of racism and, and hatred that is unbecoming of people. The most overtly racist characters in this book are the ones who are just vile. There's an innkeeper as well as this old woman who, from the get-go, are written to be unlikable. And they're the ones that are the most racist. Even though they take this Arab's money, they still really look down on it more than other characters. Like, yeah, there's, I mean, it's Victorian England, don't get me wrong, racism is abound, but these two in particular are the most, like, vitriolic about it. However, on the other hand, then the book stokes the flames of, like, racial tensions, because it involves, like, human sacrifice of, of pure, white, young, Christian women. So it like kind of splits this weird middle ground where it seems like it's it's both critiquing the thing that it's then fueling and I don't know. Uh, but there's some other interesting things that it plays around with. Uh, gender. Like I said, the preoccupation with the gender of this creature. This is like a minor sort of spoiler, but you can skip ahead. I'll put the timestamp to let you know where to go if you don't want to hear this. But in the fourth book, Marjorie is put in tattered men's clothes and that sort of sends a shockwave through the group. For some reason, they are so disturbed and disgusted by the fact that this, you know, high-bred uh, woman is romping around London in men's clothes. It's like it's unfathomable to them. But more so than any of the other themes, the one that I think that the Beatle hits most overtly is about homelessness and wealth inequality. It really sets up the first character that you see, this, this Robert Holt, it sets him up as the most sympathetic, just down on his luck. The fact that he is impoverished and homeless is not his fault at all. He has just had a string of bad luck. And then the systems that are in place to help him have failed. And that's what drives him to commit this crime, this trespass in the beginning, that eventually becomes his undoing. And this systemic inability to care for the poor is something that is reiterated again and again. Uh, Paul Lessingham, the sort of crucial character, the victim of this revenge plot, is a radical member of parliament who is trying to pass, you know, sweeping social reforms and who is put at odds with the more sort of conservative Tory government. One of the key players of that is his future father-in-law, Marjorie's father. Yeah, I think that the first chapter is, is a really good introduction to this. I liked Marjorie's chapter more, but I think the Roberts is really intriguing. So should you read The Beetle? Um... Maybe. Uh, like, if you're really into gothic literature uh, and haven't read it, then yeah, give it a go. It is an interesting occult colonial horror tale, but I think there's better out there. I found the book to kind of dawdle too much at times and be this almost, like, comedy of manners that I'm not sure was intentional or not, and also I was not a fan of the conclusion either. Well, now it's time to see how sticky Richard Marsh's The Beetle is. The book comes in at 366 pages long, and there were 18 things that sort of stuck out at me that I deemed to be stick-worthy, which gives it a stickiness rating on the stickometer of 20.33333333333, etc. But remember, the stickometer is not a judge of quality of books. That is not what I'm trying to do with that. Uh, that is kind of a reductive way of, of looking at it. This is just things that stick out to me in a text, which like I always say, are probably different from the things that would stand out to you. But with that said, thank you so much for tuning into this review and the second week of Spooky Spooktober Stories. I hope you enjoyed this review of Richard Marsh's The Beetle. If you did, leave a like, drop a comment, and if you didn't, leave a dislike and drop a comment, letting me know what I can do better in the future. Uh, and if you've read The Beetle, go ahead and let me know your thoughts, especially if you liked it. Maybe I'm not seeing something. Uh, I am not the biggest most well-versed person in, you know, gothic literature, so maybe I'm, you know, missing the point of this all and have been unfairly harsh on it. So if that's the case, let me know down below. But as always, I hope you're having a great day, or I hope you've been lulled into a very, very deep slumber from which you will wake refreshed and ready to tackle tomorrow, uh, and we will catch you on the next one. All right, thanks. Bye.